Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Smart Company webinar, How to Create a Killer Mobile App for Your Business. My name is James Thompson, and I'm the editor of smartcompany.com.au, and uh, I'm thrilled today to be joined by Kirsten Mann from Aconix, one of the great, uh, uh, a favourite company to follow here at Smart Company for many years. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Kristen. How are you? Good, thanks, James. How are you? Great, it's terrific to have you on board. Look, we'll just get through a little bit of housekeeping before I hand the, uh, the presentation over. As I said, uh, the best way to listen to today's presentation is via your speakers, um, so keep those open for the duration. Uh, you can also join via the teleconference using your telephone if you need to. Uh, the number is there uh, uh, and it will be placed in the chat box so you can uh, refer to it all day, uh, all through today's presentation, as always on Smart Company webinars, and the best way to get a message to us is through the question pane. Uh, simply whack your cursor in there, type out your question and hit send. Um, we'll do our best to get to questions as they're relevant through today's presentation, and we'll leave some time for questions at the end. Okay, very much like to thank today's sponsor which is the 2011 Australian Mobile Awards. Uh, the 2011 Mobile Awards are an awards program recognising the best of the Australian mobile industry and Smart Company is very pleased to be involved with the awards this year. Uh, for more information, hit the uh, um, web address at the bottom of your screen there, mobileawards.com.au and you can find out uh, all about the awards and what they're about. Um, Okay, without any further ado, I'd very much like to introduce formally Kirsten Mann, who's the Director of User Experience at Aconix. As I said earlier, Aconix um, is a company that we've followed for many years here at Smart Company through their rise and rise, and it's terrific to have Kirsten on board today. Welcome, Kirsten. Thanks, James. Now, hopefully, everybody can see my screen there. And yes, we can. Fantastic. So I appreciate you having me to share the Aconex mobile journey via Smart Company, um, which incidentally is a great platform for exploring what's happening in the industry. So firstly, a little bit about Aconex, the company I work for. We have over 38 offices worldwide and Aconex is the world's largest online collaboration platform for the building construction industry. The projects manager on Aconex are typically pretty large, like the rebuilding of the Panama Canal is a recent one that we're doing. Um, also, some people in Melbourne might, might recognise this small little building. It, well, it's actually the tallest building in, Mel um, in Melbourne at the moment, the Eureka Tower, and that was recently built using Aconex. We have over 200,000 users, ranging from architects, engineers, project managers, builders to subbies. And so basically, Aconex brings all these roles together and allows them to collaborate via the one system. And it makes things like document distribution, review, communication, and process management easy, easier, faster, and more secure. So today's presentation, well, just a quick disclaimer about what I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, although you'll see some key insights scattered throughout the presentation, I'm not actually here to present another top 10 design list. As there's, as there's plenty of great presentations out there that already focus on mobile app design principles. Nor will I be focusing on how to make an app number one in the App Store, although if you follow some of my points, I'm sure you'll be well on the way. And even though these are interesting topics about business mobile applications, so what's the difference between consumer and business apps? Well, I thought about this at length and discussed it with a number of people, but a colleague, Mark Bergen, who's internetly an excellent dancer, articulated this quite succinctly. There's ultimately two groups of apps consumer and business. So the idea of the difference is more to do with context. A consumer app is about me, while a business app is about my work. And my things are quite personal, and I have an ongoing relationship with them. My, so my work things, though, are transient and don't define me. So it's really about the context of the application. Now, thinking about context, the Aconex Mobile for iPhone was ultimately focused on helping to increase productivity of our users. So today I'm going to share with you our experience with building the Aconex mobile for iPhone. I'll take you through how we create an app that supports an existing business web application 
and I'll also be discussing the overall organisational experience we went through when bringing our mobile app to market. So if you saw the preamble to the seminar, you would have been seeing that I'll be covering these topics today. Why creating a mobile app can be a competitive advantage, the importance of app functionality, why your app must be useful and convenient to users, why usability is critical to the success of the app, and tips to ensure success. So let's start by having a look at why creating a mobile app can be a competitive advantage. Now there are over 4,000 business applications on the App Store. The question is, are they all really needed? And I've heard many people say when they have to do an app, it, you know, they're thinking about doing an app, they say, oh, we have to do one because all our competitors have one, or all our customers are expecting it, or simply, wouldn't it be cool to have an app? And we can, so why don't we? Now, if all your competitors have one, it's certainly worth investigating why, but purely creating an app because everyone else is, or you believe you have to be seen as having one, is simply trying to keep up with the Joneses, and not focusing on what the real need is from a user and a business perspective. So it's really important to define your purpose, and be clear about the ultimate user need, and also your organisational need. Again, this is one of those things where people often say, yeah, 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 but of course. But so often you see companies say, we need a mobile app um, because we need a mobile app, and versus really thinking about what their real business need is. For Aconex, we had a clear purpose for doing our mobile business app, and it was integrated into our product roadmap. We also did significant thinking work up front to ensure we knew how the mobile app would fit into the overall product strategy and what we'd need to put in place to support it. So for example, we were already in a good position to talk to the Aconex product suite. So we already had the technology infrastructure in place to support the creation of a mobile app. However, we also quickly identified that we needed even more APIs to support mobility needs. Now we created our business app to basically deepen engagement with the Aconex platform. So people or users who are actually out in the field without a PC or internet access could still access Aconex. Now this also further supports our core value proposition around maximising capture and increasing control. So we were really clear about what our competitive advantage was for having a mobile app. If we think about the importance of app functionality, a significant portion of literature on designing user experiences for mobile focuses on, on only using mobile apps to perform simple or single tasks. You know, have an app that does one task really well. Now, Instagram's a great example of such an app where you take a photo when you apply filters and it's really doing single tasks. Now, I'm all for simplicity, but when considering business apps, and designing for small surfaces like mobile versus large surfaces like web interfaces, you still have to remember what people are trying to do. And in the case of business applications, it will be rare that people only need to do one thing. So it's important to think of context of use, which I'll discuss in detail next, but to also remember that existing behaviour patterns from the enterprise or business app that people are used to using. So the app really needs to support common or expected workflows, and if that requires incorporating multiple tasks, then so be it. Now, I freely admit to struggling with this concept when designing the Aconex iPhone app, but when we performed usability testing, I saw firsthand that people had really strong existing workflow patterns and expectations from using the Aconex web app. So here's one quick example. Aconex is renowned for its powerful search facility, which lets you basically um, search for any project information. Now, however, to new users, this can be a little overwhelming, especially if they associate search with something like a single field Google interface. So in my initial design, I really wanted to minimise the overwhelm factor and initially just offered a single search field. However, in the usability testing sessions, users already knew Aconex's powerful search screen and kept questioning where all the other fields were. So for iteration two, I added four of the most commonly used fields, and yet again, I managed to find users who were used to using a totally different search field that I hadn't displayed. 
So for iteration three, I used a progressive disclosure team fields, and then if people wanted to get to additional fields, there was just a, sim a single tap to do so. This solved the problem, and there you can see the additional fields. But really, I had to balance perceived simplicity with existing and established behaviour patterns. Now, thinking about designing interfaces for iPhone apps, the Apple, phone, the Apple iPhone UI guidelines are a great resource for people designing or developing iPhone apps, as they provide a standard framework for layouts and interaction. So if you follow these, you're pretty much guaranteed that people using your app will recognise standard UI controls and interaction behaviours and be able to use your iPhone app. However, if something isn't working and you are aware of user experience principles, then be prepared to push the standard iPhone UX guidelines. So the caveat here is I watched before everybody goes, oh my god, is if you break the rules, you better be confident that you're designing a new intuitive experience. So here's one example that we did. The tab bar on the iPhone is a standard UI element. Usually you see four main areas to navigate, and if you want an additional option, they're hidden under a more button. Now, I followed this standard UI pattern in the initial version of the our iPhone app. And however, thinking back to our app functionality, it concerned me that key functionality was being hidden under this more option. I figured there had to be a better way to display this so people would explore that and see the other functionality that we had in the app. So this is where I came up with a design interaction where you effectively swipe the bottom nav area to see more versus tapping on a more option. Now, the other interesting thing to note here, so just down the bottom there, is effectively you can see all those options just by swiping back and forth. Now, the other interesting thing is I deliberately showed half of the directory icon, because you might have noticed that it's kind of crossed, half crossed out there. And because when I displayed only up to the capture icon there in initial testing sessions, users weren't thinking to swipe that bottom area at all. So by displaying half of that directory option, people intuitively knew there was more there and would swipe at the bottom area and see all the other functionality that we were offering in our app. So I've talked about how it's important to ensure your app functionality matches expected user behaviours. And when creating functionality, that sometimes it's important to push the standard iPhone UI conventions. Now, now just, to jump, raise... just to jump sure. in there, Kirsten, UI, user interface, and that's, that's right. the, the, the rules by which um, people use these apps, I yes, guess so is a good way to put exactly. it. Exactly. So it's basically, um, you know, the standard people are used to seeing screens on their iPhone. And those, those, there's a whole um, Apple UI guidelines which says what you kind of should back there. The standard is just to put a use four main buttons down the bottom and a more option. But we kind of pushed that convention and we did it knowing full well um, that we were achieving a better interaction experience there. Yeah, terrific. Okay, so as I said, it's important sometimes to push those if you know what you're doing and you think you can just, um, come up with something better. But I raised the question earlier in relation to screen size versus number of tasks. And this question could also be used in relation to number of features. Because many user experience principles and agile development principles for that matter talk about minimising functionality or waste and only doing what is absolutely needed in your application. So you really keep your features and you design to a bare minimum. Now, so to them, you know, they would say less is more. And it's definitely a good principle to keep in mind when you're designing experiences. However, I've seen over the years how important it is to have a few ooh or you know, sexy features that create interest in the application. And this is no different from mobile apps, especially mobile business apps. A classic case of this was one of our initial entry screens on our iPhone app. Now, when you first log into it, the app, you're presented with a list of projects. And this is a perfectly functional and effective way to navigate to a project. However, we've also got a feature where you see your projects by location on a map. And I've just got a circle around that top right-hand area, which is the map icon. And if you click on that, you get taken to a map view. Now, I have to give credit to our GM of product, Rob Philpot here, as he really fought for this feature. And I remember debating initially that it's simply not an effective way to navigate to a project, and it was kind of superfluous. Now, 
this is really one of those all features where whenever we tested the app with users and they saw this feature, they were immediately enthralled. So I've seen the sales guys start their demo with this and immediately captures interest and attention and starts a conversation. So I think it, it might also be related to the fact that our user, our user base is heavily male dominated and men love playing with maps. But it's really one of those things that captures attention and interest in the application immediately. You could say, it was it really entirely needed? No, but it is a wow feature that's created that conversation. Now in the Aconex, iPhone, in the Aconex web app, it's not easy for users to capture issues out in the field as they occur. And the beauty of a mobile device is that you can capture things then and there, either by photos or video or audio, and then use that media to communicate the issues to others. So this is where it's really valuable to utilise the unique features of a mobile device. Now, the capture feature in the Aconex iPhone app allows the user to do exactly to simply capturing photos, as you can kind of see here. But what we did was actually extend this functionality um, to include the ability to mark up an image with text or drawing. Now, this was considered initially one of those wow features. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could also mark up the image? And we didn't realise at the time how useful this would actually be, as the images captured on an iPhone are small. So if, um, it really helps people if you can highlight to other people what you're talking about. So this had a triple whammy factor when considering that functionality. We were able to utilise a powerful feature of a mobile, it had wow factor, and it was also incredibly powerful and useful. So why your app must be convenient and useful to others? Now I touched on this in the last section when considering app functionality. And again, this comes back to a basic 101 user experience principle, when, which focuses on knowing who you're designing your application for and how they're going to use it. Now at Aconex, we're over 10 years old now, and there was really a plethora of data and information available to provide insights on potential user profiles. So we then had to say, which of these user profiles would actually need the iPhone app and what would they do with it? Now we identified three key roles. The predominant mobile, the prominent mobile user, site supervisors and auditors, and project executives. Now the mobile prominent user typically holds a key role on the project. They also are medium to heavy user of Aconex and are significantly reliant on the Aconex platform to, prefer, to perform their primary job. So they really need to be able to access Aconex wherever they are on site. The other primary role was the site supervisor or auditors, and these are constantly on site as well, and one of their primary roles is to perform quality, safety or compliance audits. Now prior to the Aconex iPhone app, they'd most likely use a written form to capture issues and then manually re-enter these issues once they were back at their computer. So a mobile app saves them significant data entry time. Now the third key role for us was project executives and they typically hold a senior role on the project, and they're not necessarily a heavy user of the Aconex application, but they often need to receive Aconex mails and respond while they're in meetings to make sure that a project isn't held up. Also, they're often a key influencer in the purchasing decision for Aconex, so we would need to keep them really happy. Now, of course, having defined these user roles, it's still important to research them to ensure they're valid in the context of mobile and to ascertain if the perceived value is the actual value. Now one research exercise we did was their task was what we call a cultural probe. Now in this exercise we asked users to email us photos four times a day from their iPhone, identifying where they were and what they were doing at the time. And this helped provide rich and real insights and also helped us evaluate if we were missing any key tasks or pain points and of course, this provided context to the usefulness and convenience of what we were proposing with our mobile app. So you can see here some of the summary posters that we put together from that research exercise. Now why basically, why is usability critical to the success of an app? Well, we've discussed a number of critical elements to what goes into creating a useful and successful app, 
being a usability practitioner or user experience practitioner, I'm always going to advocate people should focus on usability and doing processes like usability testing. But I think it's even more important when it comes to mobile apps that you've really ironed out usability chinks and the interface is immediately intuitive. Consumer apps have created an expectation that I can download an app, launch it and use it immediately. Now this is because, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, often these apps are only focused on single or simple tasks. So we definitely saw that our users were less tolerant of investing time in learning anything on the mobile and any app that we did would have to be immediately intuitive. So mobile is so much more dependent on context and situation of use than desktop or web applications. So in-field usability testing versus traditional lab-based lab usability testing is even more essential to explore context of use. Now I've got a few examples here of that for us. One was ergonomic considerations and in particular around button size. Now, we had used standard size recommendations from the Apple UI guidelines that I mentioned before that kind of tell you if you design an app like this, you're on a pretty good path. Now, what we quickly realized when doing that in testing this was most of our users were male and had big hands. So the standard size meant that they were making mistakes with their selections. So we saw firsthand that bigger is better when it came to the button size and we had to enlarge our standard button sizes to accommodate this. Now, this insight was only obtained when we were testing this app out there in field with users. If we had been in a, in a lab environment, we might have seen it, but it was really noticeable when people were kind of distracted, they just wanted to get to task quickly, it was really evident this was going to be a problem. Another example of where in field testing helped us get priority on a feature was the unread mail in the app. Now, originally we didn't have an API in place to update the status of mails. So if I read still show as unread in the AKNX web app, and so I've got there on the left hand side where people see that unread mail. Now, users emphasise that this would really make them question the reliability of the iPhone app, and we had enough users saying this in our testing that product management reprioritised this API as key as a key thing to do before we release the app. So now if you read an AKNX mail on the iPhone, the web app is immediately updated. Another quick example of this was where we basically, um, we were testing out Sorry, the Kirsten, field. Sorry, Kirsten, could I just jump in just a, cu a couple of questions? API, yeah, sure. can you give us a bit of a rundown of that? Okay, um, APIs are basically allow you to, um, for external devices to be able to talk to your applications. So if you're passing information to and from, you need an API structure in place. Now, early in my presentation, I can go back to this afterwards, I had a diagram of um, what our technical structure is. And basically, if you're thinking of doing a, um, an iPhone or a mobile app, you really need, usually need that API layer in place where you can abstract and talk between your web application and your mobile application and pass data between the two. So basically, um, we had a lot of those in place when we started the development of our iPhone app, but we also identified a lot more that were required and our internal development team had to develop and deliver. Great, thanks for that explanation, terrific. Okay, so Another quick example, we picked up in, in field usability testing um, was with the standard audio player on the iPhone. Now, that's on the left hand side and you've probably seen that when you've, um, if you've got an iPhone and you've launched audio and you want to do a recording or something. And although it looks pretty slick with the microphone and things, it just wasn't intuitive to users when we were testing and we thought, you know, people would be used to using this, they would know what to do and they simply didn't. So we ended up bringing the design back to basics and making it clear how you start recording and how you stop recording and that's all they needed to do versus using half the screen with a fancy looking microphone. Now we also ran a pilot and beta program prior to launch where we further tested and refined the app and this really enabled us to iron out any major issues. So in the end, I think about around about 50 users had seen various versions through our development cycle of our iPhone app and that was great to have that amount of feedback feeding into the development cycle. Now I also mentioned um, you, 
on the useful and convenient topic before, the need for an app to be immediately intuitive and create an excellent first time experience and impression. Now visual design, I cannot tell you feed so much into that and it really shouldn't that the app is a direct reflection of your brand. The visual design is one of the key elements that helps your app stand out from the pack and helps to fine tune the usability of the app. So for example, making key buttons really distinctive and visible is something that a visual designer will usually do. So here's some visual designs that our talented senior visual intera interaction designer Nicole Lawson did. Now, you'll see here a before and after, and <laughs> hopefully you can see how the post visual design is significantly better. And it's, it's also important to note at this point that people have a positive visceral reaction to pleasant looking things. Everybody likes pleasant looking things. So, and the other thing too that they've found over the years um, with user experience design, that pleasant looking interfaces create the perception that they're easy to use. So you're already well on the way for people immediately thinking an app looks easier to use if it's pleasant looking. Here you'll see um, that Nicole also used orange deliberately here to reinforce the Aconex brand, so that's our brand colour. And here's another example of how visual design creates a more polished page and reinforces the brand. So on the standard iPhone map set, you'll just see the little um, red pins and things, and Nicole really took that in a different direction with reusing the Aconex logo and icons to kind of make it stand out that these were Aconex projects. So there's a few things to keep in mind that will help ensure you're on the way to delivering a successful business app. And when creating an app, it's, whether it be the desktop, a web app or a mobile app, people often focus on the development costs. So they'll say, oh, that's going to cost us about 20k or 50k or whatever it is. But people don't focus on the total organisational cost to bring a product to market. So really, do not underestimate the true cost of building a business app. Now, we did the thinking part, and that's Rob Philpott, our GM of product thinking there, and really work through the design before we engage developers. So we were well and truly had a product strategy in place and a high level end-to-end -end design. But obviously this still had an internal cost associated with it. We then engaged a development team in India to build the app as our core Aconex development team were in the middle of generating our major product releases. However, the Aconex um, development team led by Yoram still had to support this offshore team by answering questions about the core app and our technology and feature set. So it still required commitment and work from our internal developers as well. So our, even though our offshore development costs were quite minimal, you can see there they're around about 25k, if you add up all the other internal costs like product management, um, user experience design including interaction design, visual design, analysis, testing, marketing, the end-to-end -end cost would be closer to the 150k mark. So it's something to, to definitely be aware of if you're taking a business app to market. And, and Kirsten, can I ask, uh, or, or Jai's actually asked, did that, it, was that around about the target or, or the budget that you started out with? Yeah, we, um, we knew um, initially that it was going to um, cost a certain portion externally and I think we'd use some of the benchmarking when it takes a product internally to market before. So we had a rough idea. Um, I think bringing in initially the external development cost wasn't known for us and we actually put out a tender to um, external developers and chose an Indian um, outsourced team there. So that was really the cost we probably didn't know about going into this and um, we used a tender process to kind of identify the potential cost. But even that was incredible, the range of quotes and responses we got. Um, we had everything from 12K right up to 180K um, mm. for our offshore development. So it was quite a significant range and we really went through quite a stringent process there to evaluate the capability. And in that previous photo, uh, you could see Oliver, Vanessa and myself, who's the product manager, we actually went out to the Indian team and spent some time with them to make sure what their capabilities were um, before we engaged with them as well. So that's where the, the total offshore development cost actually included that trip too.
Just a follow-up question from Charles. Is your sense that it would have cost much more than 25k for that portion had you developed it onshore? Um, I think it, it probably would have been a little bit more, <laughs> yes, um, because just simply Australian engineers, the cost of um, running that is higher. And the same with if you have engineers in the UK or um, the US as well. So the per hour rate of offshore de the developers in this case were cheaper than ours, but there's the hidden cost where I've got a figure there for in-house development around 25k, and that was there was also a, you know a stress factor that was placed on our internal development team there having to qu respond to these queries in a timely manner when they still were working on product releases as well. So you know you've got this kind of project management overhead and overhead on people who have to respond to queries offshore as well. That mm. again is one of those hidden things, but you've got to be really careful there that you don't burn your internal resources. Great, great. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you with some more questions. They're coming in thick and fast. Okay, no worries. Success is to ensure completeness of organisational engagement. Now, how successfully you um, have you been to take all departments and stakeholders on this journey? Now, this was really important for us as we've learnt from past experiences. It's pointless going off and creating products that have amazing breakthrough if nobody in the organisation is engaged or committed with them. So if people don't feel that they were part of the journey, they won't share joint ownership in the resulting application. So it was really important for us to have all departments feel they have ownership in the end-to-end -end delivery cycle of the Akinex iPhone business app. Now the key tool to ensure organisational readiness is obvious, it's communication. And I was really lucky, as I mentioned earlier, to be working with a fantastic product manager, Oliver Finesse, and a product marketing manager, David Koopman, to really help ensure organisational readiness. So as we're a global organisation, we're really used to having to package and distribute information to people in our office so that people in our other offices can consume it. But you can see from some of these internal comms posted on our internet that you really have to, if anything, over communicate. And lots of work goes into making us organisation already and this but this ultimately contributes to the success of the app being supported by the organisation. So these were all internal blog posts that were raised. Now, apart from the communication side, it's also important for everyone in the organisation to be aware of not only what you're creating, but who you're creating it for. Who is the particular user that you're trying to meet? Now, in our case, the UX, the user experience team, which is the team that um, I manage, produced posters which provided insights into what our users were doing in a typical day, and I showed you some of those earlier. And we also wanted to communicate this information in an engaging, interactive manner as well. So we created a short video to bring these features together. We've got an amazing video artist, Sean Rodrigo, and really pulls some amazing stuff together. And he pulled this together. I kind of had to include stills because we can't run video over these webinars. But these are stills that were from the video. And what we did was pull these findings together, presented at a global sales conference to our sales team, and who we knew ultimately needed to promote the app. And it was really well received. Um, we also posted this on our corporate intranet as well, so everybody could see it and play it for themselves. So how did we go? Well, by the time we were ready to launch the app, our organisation was well and truly ready for it. And although we only launched the app just this April, it's already been deemed a success. We appeared in New and Noteworthy on the App Store. We've had over 4,000 downloads, and that was this was about a week ago. I think it's already up to the four and a half. Back on the App Store has been incredibly positive, and. I think also from an organisational point of view, our sales and marketing team have updated their collateral to highlight how our mobile app supports our core value proposition around maximising capture and increasing control. So it's been pretty successful. We've also discussed things to consider when building a business mobile app, but ultimately the audience you deliver this app to decide whether you're successful or not. Now, we're currently in the process of collecting testimonials from our users, and one fascinating thing I recently heard, and I didn't have a video camera at the time, so we're going back to film this person, 
was there was a project man manager who estimated the Aconex iPhone app was saving his company over 15k a week. Now, this is because he couldn't previously get his Aconex mails on site as they didn't have an internet connection and he didn't have an iPhone. So he couldn't tell if equipment permits had been transmitted to him until he was back at the site office. And it was about a 15 minute walk away, so he would only go and check in twice a day. Now this meant that expensive equipment, and I've got a photo there of some of the equipment he was pointing out to me, um, was often hired out, which this is often hired out at around 5k a day, would sit on site for hours unutilised as there was no clearance permits. So now he gets the permits immediately via his phone and there's no delays. So this was one of those immediate cost savings that users could tell us about from using our business iPhone app. If you want to see one of the testimonials that you've collected, again, I was going to play it today, but it, it's not actually coming through um, the, over the internet. I've got a URL there. And basically, this was another happy iPhone user, project manager, Kimo, who's been using our mobile app right from the start and kind of feels like he's the road warrior now and a tr truly mobile project manager. So what we've discussed today, well, creating a mobile app can be a competitive advantage, but you have to ensure you've clearly defined your core purpose. We've talked about the importance of that functionality, and here I discussed small screen versus single or small tasks. Um, functionality in the app should support existing workflow applications in your business or desktop app applications, so you know, basically mirroring the behaviours that people are used to. Um, don't be afraid to push standard iPhone conventions if you know what you're doing and the experience you're creating is you're sure is better and you've tested that with users. Um, supporting core functionality is important, but having wow features or sexy features certainly doesn't hurt. And utilising the unique features of the mobile device is just key because that's what it's there for. Now, why your app must be useful and convenient to users was another key topic. And here it's important to know the users you're serving. So really around those profiles. Why usability is critical to the success of the app. So we touched on here expectations that mobile apps will be immediately intuitive. You don't have a lot of time there to grasp people's attention and they're not really willing to invest in learning. How in-field usability testing provides essential insights and how it's important to invest in visual design and polishing. And I also mentioned a few tips there to ensure success, specifically around beware of hidden costs, um, ensuring organisational readiness, and this really requires clear and constant communication with your people within your organisation, really making them aware of what you're doing and how it's going to impact them, and ensure everybody knows they feel they know the user that you're designing for. So that as a user experience professionals, we essentially exist to balance user needs with user expectations. And when we achieve that, there's really nothing better. So for Aconex, the successful design and delivery of our mobile app has provided an excellent taste test for the organisation. And we're now really investing heavily in other mobile development projects, which we are actually doing inshore and offshore as well. So our internal development team are now doing some of those and we're also still working with offshore developers too. And for those, we're using other innovative technologies like HTML5. So really my last point here, and it's, it's a shameless self-promotion plug, our app has been nominated for a Moby, I love that name, and it's part of the 2011 Australian Mobile Awards that James mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. And from my perspective, it's really fantastic to be part of these awards, as they're the first program I've seen that have categories dedicated to mobile business apps. So we're truly excited to be part of the Moby. So please have a look at our submission and vote for us. If you enter Aconex into the search engine at the top right-hand corner, I've got it there, and you can see the orange button, um, our submission will come up and you can see a bit more on our project videos and things. So that's about it for me for now. I'm happy to ask any questions. Terrific, Kirsten. Thank you very much for that. It's a, uh, fascinating to sort of go inside the process and find out about uh, all, all, all that is involved. And I think uh, a lot of our, uh, as you said at the start, a lot of companies sort of have a great idea. Wouldn't it be great to have an uh, iPhone app or an app, a mobile app of some description? <laughs> and the, uh, as you've shown us today, the, the actual work is a lot harder um, than, just, than just that. A, a question from a few of our... Um, 
uh, our audience members today. Uh, Guy, I think, asked this first. How long, or what was the length of time from uh, sort of uh, the genesis of the idea through to um, release? Okay, so we in um, the idea started in May, and that was when the thinking time really kicked in, um, thinking about our product strategy, how it would fit in. We didn't actually start, we went out to tender, so that's May last year, we went out to tender in August, um, so you had May, June, July, August, it was four months of effect effectively thinking the product strategy, product management, and we did a high level design as well, like how would this fit together, and I actually talked and went out in field with users and tested that design too, and just in that initial design, because I know, um, you know, there's, there's a line here with a lot of agile development principles, you know, do you, um, how much design do you do up front? For us, especially if you're tendering or um, doing an offshore development group, you really have to provide a clear picture of what you want from those people. Otherwise, you're really setting yourself up to just endless cycles of going back and forth. So we really locked down what we wanted. We were clear. I tested that and refined that with users. And so we went out to tender in August, engaged a company in September, late September and actually started our development cycle at the end of October. So really our app was, um, our development cycle went for three and a half months and that was very intense and very condensed. We worked over Christmas, <laughs> which my family loved, and mm. um, basically, and because we knew we had, we had certain expectations in terms of releasing this to market as well. So by February, our app was done and we went into a pilot program with users. So we really, for the month of February slash March, put it out there with, um, in the end we had 30 uh, pilot slash beta customers using the app, getting feedback, refining it, and we launched then in April. So it, I think all end to end, um, it was you know, about nine months. We could have done it in about six, I think, um, but remembering too what I talked about, getting the organisation ready, just having, the, it, depending on the size of your company and things too, trying to do, you know, posts, communicate things, get in front of different stakeholders across the business, those things, you know, you need to give yourself a certain amount of time. Also, being able to do some of the research exercises we did, like the cultural probe I mentioned, we ran that as well in parallel. So. You know, it's it's really mapping out how big your application is going to be and what you need to validate will dictate what your timeline is going to be as well. Mm -hmm. uh, question for, from a, a few of our members again, Jeremy, Ray, and I think Peter as well. Calculating the ROI of, of the app. Um, yep. I guess it's not a straightforward uh, it's free. Um, yep. so, so there's now, no could, immediate I, revenue return. Well, well what, what I might, just, just on that point, James, mm. I might actually, we, we really debated about do we, the price point of our app as well, like do we make yep. it free, do we um, charge people for that? And what you've got to remember too with a business or enterprise app is that people um, who are downloading this, if you charge them for it, they're then going to expense that back to their company. So depending who it is, like one of our clients are BHP, for example, so if we had a 1,000 BHP users downloading our application and then expense claiming that through as well, their organisation, they might get a bit narky about it as well. So sure. you've got to also think if all of these individual users are going to be downloading your app and then re-expensing that, what will that do to an organisation too? How will they respond? For us, because our, one of our key strategies was around adoption, we want as many people as possible on the Aconex platform. So it was about pushing our app out and getting use as much as possible to people. Um, but there's a kind of considerations as it's not just a straight, um, you know, do I charge $10 for this and am I going to make a core return for that? Um, it's also thinking in your complementary product strategy, how does this fit in as well? And not just thinking a straight, right, we've spent X number on this, that means that we want to get 156 downloads or whatever it is. Yep, yep. But it, it, I mean, uh, by the sounds of it, your, your internal sense within Iconics is that 
you, you've already got quite a good return on the, this investment. Yeah, we we our um, target for the first um, year was fifteen hundred users. <laughs> We've already smashed yeah. that, um, and basically it was really if, you know that was equated that if we had that many users and they they were adopting and using the platform on a regular basis and communicating via Aconnect, all of those things were kind of thought out. What did that mean to our bottom line? And um, so for us, it's, it's different. Like some people will do a straight dollar return, right, if we charge $10 for this. Um, and sure, people value apps in different ways. Um, but they're also quite funny. You would have noticed this too, that often people won't think about paying 3 bucks for a coffee each day or 350 But <laughs> 350 iPhone app, they'll go, oh, no, I'll go and find a free one. So it, even the mindset around consumer apps, which is kind of, you know, bubbled over to business apps as well, is still there. And people, if they're paying for something, they really want to be able to try and buy first um, before they just take a wild gamble on your app. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the app versus the mobile website. Um, right. uh, per yeah. Perhaps a mobile website wouldn't have done everything that you needed this uh, application to do, I guess. Yeah, at the time, we did explore HTML5 when we first started um, our development cycle and it was just it was just still a bit too immature there weren't enough um, business applications out there it, for us it's we've got a feature a number of features in our app that are around local caching so I can basically download um, a document from the um, from Aconex and keep it on my iPhone and reference it offline now that for all you know as I showed the capture feature I can take photos and things like that then when I get an internet connection, it will sync back up to Aconex. So having that offline capability was very important for us. Now at the time, it was hard to see with HTML5 whether that was really going to be capable and how robust it was. Now the only challenge, of course, when you do a native iPhone app is what's the next question that everybody has as soon as we launched? When are you having a BlackBerry app? When are you having a Google uh, an mm. Android app? When are you having an iPad app? You know, every that was the minute we launched, everybody was through that. And of course, if you do them natively, you have to build one for every single one of those environments. We did explore platforms that let you do one code base and spit out to multiple handsets, but again it was a bit clunky and it was a very heavy footprint on the phone as well. So the app was just a bit clunky, it seemed to take a long time to launch, those kind of things. So interestingly, in, we are, as I mentioned, because of the success of the iPhone app, implement, basically investing in more um, mobile projects. And we're in the process of building um, a mobile app that's entirely in HTML5. And that's really now because we've seen a couple of other um, apps that are out there that are business apps that are doing more robust things. So I think the technology is now getting there that enables you to do that. And you can basically use what are called wrappers that wrap around HTML5 and allow you to use the device's um, features like the phone and things like that. So definitely in the last nine months, the, the market's really come a long way. So that, 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 that uh, new iteration will allow you to be on, on Android, which is emerging pretty quickly. Yeah, and any for our perspective, you'll be able to be on. It's it's a different it's a different product. Like it's not the Aconex um, one that I've. It's an entirely new product that we're actually designing and developing at the moment. Um, but yeah, you'll be able to be on any device, and it will just be viewed um, basically by the web browser. But it will feel like it's part of the, um, like a native app in a sense. Very good. Which I, which leads us to an interesting question from Christy. What is the life expectancy of an app? When, when, how soon will you have that sort of new version around? And, and, and after that, do you think you'll have to keep updating every year, every two years? For us, because our iPhone app supports our business application, our web app, it's a constant development cycle. And this is the other thing to consider. So it's a great question from Christy there. That if you're developing um, an iPhone app that's complementary to something you're already doing, you are in a, the same maintenance cycle that you are with that main app. So for example, as we do things in our web app now, um, as different features, are, a new feature that's coming into our web app is our mail forms, it means we now have to put that into our iPhone app because people expect that behavior and functionality that they've been able to do in the web app 
in their iPhone app as well. So essentially, once you've got that, if you're going to support an existing business application, you are in constant revision cycles. And the same with APIs, because APIs are constantly updated, monitored. Again, you have to be refining that from your phone as well. So it, it never ends. If it does, then it's not probably an app that's supporting an existing business application. Mm, fair enough. Um, a quick question on the tender process from uh, yep. um, from Richard. Uh, how, how did this work for you guys, and, and where do you post that type of tender? Right, we use Dataconnect. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've got in Dataconnect we have a tender module, um, and basically it was a matter of we identified um, providers that seemed we wanted people that had been in the market for a while that had um, a lot of examples of work they'd done that we could actually download and see. Also that had clients that were already in Australia, in UK or in um, America too because we knew then that they would be used to communicating across different time zones. And we also rang those clients. We asked for client references which we rang and talked about the experiences too. So we basically set up a requirements document which we put out and said, right, this is what we're um, looking to build. We had a, um, a design prototype so they could see the kind of interactions. And as I mentioned before, we were pushing the boundary with some of these interactions. So we knew that um, we needed a developer that could be really quick with that stuff and, and work through it versus just kind of sticking in their standard box. And we put that out. We got. Um, we limited, we didn't just do an open tender to anybody who wanted to respond. Um, interestingly, the, there was only a couple from Australia that I think maybe because they were, had a lot of work on already, but who didn't, they didn't really put the effort into the response. And that also showed us as well that if they're not really responding now and, and giving us any time, then they're probably not going to do it during our development cycle. Um, so there's a couple of key kind of indicators that you see come through. We evaluated those responses, spoke to those, checked the client references. As I said, actually went and <laughs> they had an office that they existed. And yeah. um, so it was a thorough process. We didn't just say, oh, this kind of looks good, it's cheap, let's go. Um, we really wanted to make sure that this group was a partner for us because we knew we wanted to, um, if this was successful, we were going to be wanting to do more work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, really interesting question from Ron. Obviously, uh, you've done very well getting in the new and noteworthy section on the ICE on the App Store, but of course, this is an app for existing Aconix users. Yes. If a member of the public who's never uh, used Aconix before um, finds your app and downloads it, how does that work? <laughs> That's a good question, Ron. Um, basically, in the current design for our app, we've we've catered um, entirely for current Aconex users. So in future versions, it's slated that we would have a demo version. So if you're not an Aconex user, you'd be able to basically come in under a demo ID and see what it does. But the reality is that um, it's, you know, Aconex isn't the standard, you know, uh, it's not the type of thing that you just go and pick up off the shelf and, and use. It's, it's something that projects are set up um, all the people working on the project understand what that project's about and they're collaborating, communicating. So it's quite different than just trying to um, you know, download a, a finance app or something that is going to do yeah. your finances. It's, it's quite specifically tailored to a project. So definitely for our first release, when we were prioritising things, um, to us it was more important to get features that were useful for our current users versus prioritising a demo model in there where we knew our current um, users would know us and have user logins and be able to get straight into our application. People who were potentially interested in Aconex um, and would they come to an I down to the app store and download it? Our clients who are the you know the people that pay for Aconex, they're such busy people they're unlikely to be you know, just dabbling around and ha saying, oh, let me have a look at this Aconex product and yep, now I'm going to spend a lot of money and go and buy it. So it's the person that we target um, for purchasing Aconex is quite a different profile as well. So it, general users, it wouldn't have been relevant. But it's definitely something we want to do in future releases. Hmm. Uh, good question from Dina. Um, tips on encouraging people to leave a rating, and I guess we should extend that by saying it looks like you've done a fair bit of work into 
gathering testimonials and user feedback and that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, in the a lot of apps nowadays as well um, will come up with prompts saying rate us or you know go and um, come to do you want to rate us and you can do it from within the phone and mm. that's kind of nice um, to be able to do it. We've we haven't got that. Um, relied on people rating us through the app store and that's where we've collected our ratings. It's again it's dependent if it's the type of application that would be an open business app and you're trying to sell it to the public and, and move, it'd be great having um, getting that type of rating and feedback from the iPhone directly instead of people having to go to the app store. Again, it's not as important for us because, um, you know, it, again, what I've noticed, and this was just um, a recent example, the example I mentioned where the gentleman was talking about the savings that he's had. When we first went and did um, on site and talked to him about the iPhone, there was, and I did a bit of a demo to the people there, there was about three or four people that had iPhones. Within, we went back there two months later, it was something like 30 people on that site were walking around with iPhones. Mm. So it's, for us it's very much a word of mouth thing as well. It just spreads, people see it, they can see what you can do and it's really kind of going through word of mouth for us is even more important that people have a positive experience and they talk to other people on a project about it is really one of our key um, pushing mechanisms. Mm. Uh, we're running out of time, Kirsten, but I, I do want to ask a question that, uh, that Ray asked, um, which is a good one. For, for businesses, for, for smaller businesses that are, uh, um, you know, perhaps can't stump up uh, large amounts of money for app development but, but would still like to get involved, it, it, is the key just to perhaps concentrate on one simple bit of functionality that adds a, a, adds value to their customers, and you know the, the more stripped down it is, uh, I guess the cheaper it is. Yeah, and that's definitely true. I mean, we have a lot of screens in the app, which you know I think in the end, even though there's some of the screens are the same, it's you know up to the 200 mark. So there's a lot of work and workflows that have gone into our app, which of course contribute to development costs and testing costs and all of those things. But um, it's I think if if as a business you, and especially a small business thinking where how do we, it comes back to that core proposition, do you really need this? Is it going to make a significant difference to your users? If it is and you can versus hey everybody else seems to be doing it so we'll do it, if you think it's really going to make a difference, the key thing I would suggest is really map out what you're trying to do first, like what is it, what's going to be, what you think that experience is going to be for your customers or users and mapping that out, have a clear idea of that, work through the, the um, process from your side and then engage a developer. Don't go to the developer first and say, hey, we're thinking about doing this app, we wanted to do this and this, and then just work through it with them because you're just going to churn and burn time. And so really think about how it's going to fit in with your, the rest of your product strategy and work that through, just draw it out. You know, you don't have to be able to draw things beautifully or anything like that. Just map out that workflow. And again, for a developer, if you engage then a developer and they've seen that work, they'll see that you know you've also had a thought and think about what it means to you and and what you want from it. And it's just going to make that conversation with the developers so much easier too. The other thing I'd say too is you know shop around a bit, see apps that you like, find out who's developed those talk to other businesses and see what their experiences have been with um, developing apps and find a partner that's willing to work with you because just like in the web world when you know there was lots of cowboys first starting out to do um, websites, there's a lot of cowboys out of there that just want to get the money and run and it's really important that from a business perspective you establish a relationship with these development partners because as per Chrissy's, um, Kristen's question earlier, that it, it will be an ongoing thing. It's rare that you'll do one version of an app and that's it. It's probably going to be an ongoing development cycle once you enter into this. Yeah, couldn't have said it better myself, Kirsten. I think we've had about or oh, 650,000 approaches to to build apps recently, and um, it does seem to be the new promised land. So uh, Ray, yeah. do plenty of work yourself, and you'll be well uh, well positioned. Yeah, look, uh, that's great. Uh, Kirsten, thank you very much for taking us through that. It's fascinating to actually see how an app comes together and um, uh, 
thank you for letting us inside the Aconics process because um, no it's, uh, it, it, it's rare that you actually get to see as much as we've got to see today. I, I feel like we've been uh, inside the business and seen some of the... Um, <laughs> <laughs> too much. <laughs> oh, well, we've seen the white ball, so that's great. Um, <laughs> terrific. I'll, I'll just get you to flick to the next slide uh, sure. first and we'll uh, again remind you of the 2011 uh, Australian Mobile Awards. You've got an extra reason to uh, get to the website today and that's to go and check out uh, Aconix's great app and have a look at some of the other really good examples of uh, apps that are out there. Um, lots of great Australian companies doing great things in this uh, space and as, uh, as Kirsten said, it's really great to see business apps specifically recognised in these awards. So uh, check out the 2011 Mobile Awards. And uh, thank you again, Kirsten. Um, wh when are the when are the award ceremony? Um, wh when when will you hear? Um, I think the award cer ceremony is um, second week of September. Or oh, yes, so there's essentially five weeks left for voting now, and I think it's partly a, a public vote, but also a judging vote as well. And um, so. I hope Yeah, I've just got uh, something from Mark Bergen who's saying September the 8th in Sydney. So uh, that, that's the official date. So uh, yeah, not too long to go before voting finishes and then the awards will be handed out. Will be exciting. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, so uh, thank you to thank you again to Kirsten, and thank you particularly to our audience. We're getting uh, lots of little notes of thanks on the um, on the uh, on the question. Uh, box there, so that's a uh, testament to how uh, much everyone's enjoyed today's webinar, Kirsten. But thank you to you. We have some terrific questions, and obviously, uh, huge, huge thirst for knowledge about this uh, app building process. And I think we've got a great insight, a rare insight into the uh, into how the entire process works. So thank you very much to everyone for joining us on uh, Smart Company webinars. Uh, check out the Mobile Awards site, and uh, perhaps cast a vote for the fantastic Aconics Award. Um, and Kirsten, good luck uh, in early September with the awards. Thanks so much, James, and thanks to Smart Company for having us. Terrific. Thank you very much for all joining us. Uh